Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are. I am delighted to welcome everyone to this really special event, a celebration of the first two winners of the Langer Prize for Innovation and Entrepreneurial Excellence, held in conjunction with the Pharmaceutical Discovery, Development, and Manufacturing Forum's Emerging Modalities Conference. I am Pablo de Benedetti, Dean for Research at Princeton University, and Chair of the Board of Trustees of the ASCHE Foundation. It is great to be with all of you by video, although of course it would be even better to celebrate the accomplishments and promise of the 2019 and 2020 Langer Prize recipients in person. The Langer Prize was established in 2019 to honor in perpetuity Bob Langer's extraordinary accomplishments and pioneering spirit. It recognizes and empowers exceptionally talented young researchers and engineering entrepreneurs to tackle high risk, high impact challenges with the potential for achieving game-changing innovations. By providing up to $100,000 in seed funding, the prize allows the recipient to try blue sky concepts without constraints. As we all know, Bob faced significant obstacles at the beginning of his career because his ideas went against the prevailing orthodoxy of the times. The prize is intended to provide exactly the type of unrestricted funding that enables creative individuals to test high risk, high impact ideas. In other words, the goal is to enable one future Bob Langer per year in perpetuity. In the course of his extraordinary career as a scientist, engineer, inventor, entrepreneur and innovator, Bob Langer has educated, mentored, inspired, and trained generations of biomedical engineers, chemical engineers, and bioengineers. Hundreds of Langer alumni now occupy distinguished and leading positions in academia and in industry. The recipients of this award will likewise become part of a network of Langer fellows with access to and support from some of industry's foremost experts in innovation and entrepreneurship. I would like to congratulate our two inaugural Langer Prize recipients. Cesar de la Fuente is Presidential Assistant Professor at the University of Pennsylvania, where he holds appointments in the departments of psychiatry and microbiology, the Institute for Biomedical Informatics, the Institute for Translational Medicine and Therapeutics, and the Penn Institute for Computational Science, all within the Perlman School of Medicine, and also in the Department of Bioengineering. Cesar is our 2019 recipient. Maria Eugenia Inda is a postdoctoral associate at MIT Synthetic Biology, and she's our 2020 recipient. Congratulations to both of you. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Bob Langer, the David H. Koch Institute Professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Doing justice to his extraordinary career would take the entire time allotted to this ceremony. So let me just say that he's the most cited engineer in history. His more than 1,500 articles have been cited more than 330,000 30, times. He runs the world's largest bioengineering laboratory, he was the youngest person in history at age 43 to have been elected to the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. He's one of three living individuals to have received both the U.S. National Medal of Science and the National Medal of Technology and Innovation. He has over 1,400 issued and pending patents worldwide, and he's the recipient of more than 220 major awards. Bob? to you. Well, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure and an honor for me to be able to speak uh, uh, about the winners of, of uh, this prize that AICHE was kind enough to uh, honor in my name. Uh, I was asked to talk about three things. One, to uh, talk about my early career, two, to talk about my own mentoring, and three, just to give some words of advice to the recipients of, 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 of the award. You know, my own career when I started actually was uh, very uh, rocky actually. It, 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 I was a graduate student at MIT and uh, almost all my friends went to oil work in oil companies and I, I thought I'd probably do that too, but I wasn't that excited ab about that. 
so I, um, I, 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 even though I got some job offers, I, I, I didn't do that. I ended up doing postdoctoral work actually in a hospital, Boston Children's Hospital at Harvard Medical School. And I was actually the only engineer there. And it was hard for me in the beginning because I didn't know any biology, but I got involved in several projects, very experimental projects. Uh, one to isolate substances that could stop blood vessels from growing and another involving developing some of the first drug delivery systems using uh, different materials like polymers. But what happened was when I finished, I actually couldn't get jobs in chemical engineering departments uh, as a faculty member because people at that time felt that the bio work that I was doing didn't fit in. So I didn't get any, I actually uh, um, ended up working in a nutrition department uh, for a number of years. And actually I had trouble getting uh, research grants. My first nine were rejected. Uh, and, and so it was a very uh, inauspicious uh, start but eventually things worked out and uh, I did join the chemical engineering department at MIT. And, and one of the things that I got very involved in doing because it meant a lot to me was to, to see if I could take the ideas that I had and had worked on in the lab with my students and, and really get them out to the world. And so what we did is we filed patents and we started companies. You know, today there's, I think, well over a hundred products based on the kinds of things that our lab did that have affected many millions of people. So that, that's been very, very gratifying, but, but it sure didn't start out that way. And actually I should say when I was doing it, a lot of professors looked down upon that kind of work. They didn't think it was good to mix uh, trying to do translational work with, uh, you know, with the work we were, you know, more basic work we were doing at MIT. But it was important to me, and I feel it's led to many companies, many jobs, and and products that, in many cases, uh, really have changed people's lives. It's also been very important to me to mentor people, and I've been incredibly fortunate to have had wonderful students and postdocs. I think close to 400 now are professors at different universities uh, and companies. A number of them have actually started companies, been CEOs of companies, and and they and they've all had wonderful, wonderful careers. I think something like twenty are in the National Academy of Engineering. I think sixteen are in the National uh, uh, Academy of Medicine. I think over thirty are in uh, um, the National Academy of Inventors, and uh, some forty uh, have been received the Technology Review thirty five uh, status. So I, and, and I guess my style of mentoring has been a very loose style. I, I, I try to really uh, encourage people to work on projects that I feel will be, you know, very, you know, basic, but, but hopefully if they're successful, could have a big impact. You know, I try to encourage people to publish and, and, and uh, but I, I, I try to give people a lot of freedom because someday they're going to be their own boss, whether it's running a laboratory in a university or whether it's uh, being at a company. And um, all those have been, uh, you know, led to, I think, tremendous careers uh, for, for, for different people. Uh, and, and, I, and that's something I've been incredibly proud of, uh, in particular when people ask me what's my greatest accomplishment, I always say, well, I like to think it's how well my students have done. You know, in terms of advice to, uh, to Cesar and Maria, who are the recipients uh, last year and this year of, of the award, I mean, both of them have had just already uh, incredible careers. Uh, so there's, there's, I don't know what, what advice I could really give them beyond to just keep what, doing what they're doing. But, uh, you know, but I think the advice I, I, I give people in general are to dream big dreams, dreams that uh, hopefully can change the world. I also usually say that if, uh, you know, you do that, and I certainly ran into this in, in my career, which is why I got the grants turned down and everything else, is that if you, if you do that, if you try to do things that might change people's thinking, a lot of times you'll run into opposition and people will tell you, you know, who are reviewers and so forth, that your ideas won't work and that it's impossible. But I think that's very rarely true. I think if you really believe in yourself, if you keep pushing and pushing and knocking down barriers and walking through walls if you have to, uh, that, uh, that, that hopefully those dreams will come true. But you have to have a lot of persistence and, and uh, you have to keep uh, trying and trying and, and, and recognizing that um, 
you know, that, that not everything's going to work right the first time or even sometimes the 200th time. But, uh, but if, if their ideas are important, they're, they're well worth pursuing. And, and I guess the other thing is to always try to treat people well, because the people who work with you, whether they're your students or your employees, I mean, you want them to have great lives. And, and I think, you know, for me, I've gotten a lot of satisfaction out of, out of how, of, of, of sharing uh, the successes, uh, you know, and, and that, that my, my students and postdocs have had. And so that's been a very important aspect too. So I would, would say that as well. So in conclusion, I, I just want to, congratulate Cesar and, and Maria for, for receiving these awards. I, you know, what they've done is uh, far, far more impressive than I was at, 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 at uh, that, that stage. And, uh, you know, and, and I certainly didn't win any honors or anything till I think I was like 38. So uh, anyhow, it's great to see them, them doing so well and, and uh, congratulations and thank you. First of all, um, thank you, Bob, for the very kind introduction. It's really, an honor for me to have been selected as inaugural recipient of the Langer Prize. And I really look forward to building an extremely exciting community of innovators in years to come. And it's really a pleasure to be here today to tell you about our lab's ongoing efforts, uh, trying to develop novel antibiotics by means of computers, research that is actually currently uh, being supported by the, by the Langer Prize. And so, Next, I'll uh, share my presentation and, uh, and I'll uh, proceed with, with the talk. So antibiotics are the foundation of modern medicine. They protect us from infections stemming from injuries and uh, childhood maladies and they make surgeries, transplants, childbirth, and chemotherapy possible. Antibiotic-resistant infections are predicted to become the leading cause of death in our society. These infections are estimated to kill 10 million people annually by the year 2050, surpassing even cancer as a cause of death and costing the global economy uh, $100 trillion, and correspond to the staggering number of one death every three seconds. The natural world, which has been a great innovator supplying nearly all antibiotics we have available today, is running out of inspiration. As observers of nature's vast molecular diversity, we have isolated many antibiotics with life-saving properties such as penicillin and many, many others. For decades, however, no new molecular scaffolds have emerged and bacteria have become increasingly resistant to existing drugs. In my lab, we believe that the next generation of antibiotics is likely to come not from nature, but from machines. And so what we're doing is we're digitizing nature's chemistries into ones and zeros to enable machines to discover uh, uh, the medicines of the future. But within the huge diversity of molecules that exist, which ones should we focus on to create novel antibiotics? Well, if you go through the tree of life and you think uh, about which molecules have intrinsic antimicrobial qualities, there's actually a unique set of molecules that fit the bill. And these belong to a, a family of, of small proteins called host defense peptides. Uh, they're very small, they're genetically encodable, they're chemically synthesizable, and so they represent excellent scaffolds for engineering. So how do we engineer these? Uh, how do we program these HDPs? Well, we use basic rules of protein engineering that tell us that if we can control the, the, the sequence of amino acids, the building blocks that make up these molecules, we'll be able to control their biological function. So we're essentially, I, I liken this to, to playing Lego with these molecules. That's what we do in the lab. We try to rearrange the amino acids in specific positions to be able to create molecules that do not uh, yet exist. So this is the general framework that we use in the lab to truly try to understand these molecules. And, um, mostly we focus on proteins and peptides. First, we want to understand from first principles the underlying chemistry and physics uh, of these compounds. Next, we're in a position to control the structure function in the laboratory, and we can do this both chemically and, and, bio, and biologically at this point. And finally, once we've, achieved, we, once we've achieved this level of control, we can teach everything we've learned to computers. 
I think this is a very interesting, uh, important point to make. Uh, without the prior understanding of these molecules, it's very, very difficult to teach computers something that we humans do not actually understand. And this uh, really echoes uh, Feynman's words of what I cannot uh, create, I do not understand. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus mostly on the computational work that we've been doing since also this is what is most relevant to the longer price. So uh, again, trying to uh, use computers to create novel antibiotics. And uh, because we focus on, on proteins and peptides, um, we have, these molecules have an incredibly vast sequence space. And uh, part of the problem here is that we want to innovate. And in order to innovate, we need to explore this sequence space to see if we can find sequences of amino acids that are different from what uh, has evolved in nature um, that represent potential uh, antibiotics that we can use today. And uh, so just to show you the complexity of the problem, I'm showing here uh, different uh, sequence spaces of things that we're maybe more familiar with, with concepts that we may be familiar with. For example, the number of people on Earth is 10 to the 10, number of stars in the universe, 10 to the 31. Well, if we consider a very small peptide composed of only 25 amino acids, uh, it actually yields a chemical space that is superior to the number of stars in the universe. So uh, we obviously need computers to explore this incredibly vast uh, space of possibilities. And in addition, uh, to make uh, things uh, more complicated and interesting at the same time, uh, biological evolution through billions of years has only sampled a tiny fraction of the entire space of possibilities of all potential uh, proteins and peptides. And so all this white space represents uh, unexplored space. So what we're trying to do is use computers to uh, push the boundaries of sequence space uh, to be able to um, identify uh, new molecules in all these white uh, previously unexplored uh, space of mo potential molecules. And um, so the first challenge we had is that we asked the question, how can we innovate using computers? And so um, in the end, the, the, the answer uh, that we reached was uh, probably in hindsight, the most obvious one. Why not just do it just the way uh, nature does it? And of course, uh, we have all, all evolved using uh, very similar, you know, the same principles, which is essentially Darwin's algorithm of evolution. So we decided to train computers to evolve these molecules, just like we have evolved from the very first organisms to have ever existed um, through a mutation selection and recombination. So what we did is we started with an initial population of molecules, the HTPs from nature, and we taught the computer to execute uh, this function of mutation selection recombination in n-fold iterations in a feedback loop to be able to innovate. So here I'm showing one of, the, uh, one of the simulations where with increasing number of iterations, we can see how the molecules evolve towards uh, optimal uh, fitness value, uh, values that correlate with predicted antibiotic activity uh, that is predicted by the computer. So the computer is able to evolve the molecules and in the process of doing so, we can also explore those regions of unexplored sequence space, that, that white space that I mentioned. And, um, a, and by doing so, it can yield molecules that are different from what we typically find in the natural world. So here we can see uh, computational simulations of some of the best molecules the computer created. Um, and at this point, we reach a roadblock that is very common to all innovations involving computers. Uh, all molecules created by the machine represent a prediction. And in other words, the machine thinks that the molecules it has created will be good antibiotics, but we still need to validate this experimentally. So that's what we did. We synthesized a lot of these molecules chemically in the lab, and we tested them against bacteria. And we're able uh, to identify a number of heats, of lead compounds, one of them uh, which kill bacteria at a very low dose, uh, particularly if we compare it to some of the starter, uh, starting templates that computers started the simulation with, which were essentially non-antimicrobial. And we did this on purpose uh, to uh, demonstrate as a proof of principle that we could teach a computer to turn a non-active molecule into an active one. Here I'm showing the three-dimensional structure of the lead molecule created by the computer. We can see that it's elucidated through NMR. We can see that it forms this beautiful alpha helix. And here's the same molecule in three-dimensional space. And uh, in my lab, we're always interested in translating everything we do uh, to, to the clinic, hopefully, 
that's the overarching goal. And so we, next we, um, we assessed the uh, translational potential of this molecule in a preclinical mouse model. And the, the machine made antibiotic actually resolved the infections better than uh, two of the templates the computer started the simulation with. And here we have the treated control group of mice as a reference, so you can get an idea of how much, uh, how effective they are. But we're very excited about this. We, you know, it's the first step uh, uh, towards really using uh, computational tools to be able to design uh, novel antibiotics uh, that may be able to treat uh, highly drug-resistant organisms that are uh, no longer uh, treatable, really, with, uh, with existing drugs. In addition to using machines to create new antibiotics, we're also very interested in harnessing their power to be able to discover novel antibiotics, perhaps in places where people have not traditionally looked before. And uh, the truth is that there's a whole world out there of uh, sequences uh, within genomes and proteomes of things that people don't, that we don't fully understand. And the idea here is how can we decrypt this information to be able to unveil this um, treasure trove of uh, novel potential medicines. And because of all the previous work that we've done, we, in this case, we knew which molecules to look for. Um, so we could now mine biology, uh, searching for such molecules. And uh, the analogy here would be to having a, a huge, a very large word document, where you're trying to find the word hello within the document. So basically, you know where you're looking for the word hello, and so it's relatively easy to find even in very complex data. And so this is kind of how we did it. To address this problem, um, we took inspiration from image and speech recognition algorithms, but instead of recognizing facial expressions or sounds, we wanted to recognize molecular patterns that uh, represented antibiotics. And um, again, like I mentioned, uh, we essentially developed a search engine to be able to find antibiotic sequences or code in very large uh, biological databases. This is essentially how the algorithms work. If we have an entire molecule in three dimensions that we can see here, and then we can display it in two dimensions, uh, what the algorithm does is it runs through the code of amino acids and it identifies um, hotspots uh, uh, shown here by the different colors that represent potential antibiotic sequences within the larger protein. And um, this is done by an antimicrobial score or AS here. And of course, since we're again using computers, the information obtained is just a prediction, but it's a very powerful one because it allows us to identify small fragments within large, uh, large molecules, in this case proteins, with uh, previously un unappreciated antibiotic uh, properties. And what we can do then is we can take those fragments from the entire molecule and we can extract them uh, from uh, its parent uh, protein uh, to play around with it in the laboratory and to develop it uh, into a potential and a novel therapy. So using such algorithms, we have now mined the entire human body and have found thousands of previously undescribed tiny molecular fragments uh, hidden within the realm of our bodies that we call encrypted antibiotics. We've now synthesized a lot of these molecules in, in the lab and have shown that they indeed represent new classes of antibiotics. Uh, for some of them, we have even shown also efficacy uh, in a preclinically relevant animal models. Our results point to the proteome as a previously untapped source of new uh, drugs and reveal the multifunctional nature of uh, a lot of these proteins that we've, that we've found. Um, and um, the data uh, that we've collected so far suggests connections between host immunity and other systems throughout the body that were, uh, that were previously unrecognized uh, as arms of, of host immunity such as the nervous system, the endocrine system, digestive and cardiovascular system. So essentially we found these encrypted antibiotics uh, hidden within proteins, like I'm saying, all throughout the body in different body systems, therefore linking all these, uh, all these systems uh, with, with innate immunity. What we're able to show also is that uh, encrypted peptides uh, derived from the same biogeographical area throughout the body uh, they potentiate each other's activity, antimicrobial activity. So they, through synergistic interactions, they're, um, by, com by doing combination therapy with a cocktail of these molecules, again, from the same area of the body, they can kill bacteria at nanomolar range concentrations. 
uh, which is within the range at which they are uh, produced physiologically in the body. Uh, in addition, interestingly, we run a resistance assay to look at whether uh, to evaluate whether bacteria develop resistance to these encrypted uh, molecules. And uh, we can see here that after 25 days or so, bacteria uh, such as Acinetobacter baumani, which is a highly drug resistant organism that is very relevant to the clinic. Uh, we can see the polymyxin B, which is a classical antibiotic that is used in the hospital. Um, the bacteria develop resistance to this drug um, very substantially. However, uh, in this case, the, the microbe is unable to develop resistance uh, to the encrypted molecules after 30 days. So this is quite exciting. It means that bacteria are not readily developing resistant um, mechanisms to these molecules. This is just to show you that uh, I'm showing four of the proteins uh, that we found in the body and just to show you at what, uh, to what extent they're being produced physiologically and, and at, different, at different rates uh, all throughout the body as we can see here is to illustrate the potential relevance of these findings. And then of course, um, of course we, uh, we decided to test the efficacy of these molecules in a mouse model. And again, we're able to, to show uh, convincingly that these encrypted antibiotics uh, basically resolve infections in mice, uh, not only in individual therapies, but also in combination therapies through their uh, highly synergistic interactions. So I told you how we can use these pattern recognition algorithms to really mine uh, the, human, uh, the human body uh, as a previously really untapped source of, of novel uh, antibiotics and novel medicines. Um, but we're not, uh, we're not exclusively limited to, to, to any particular uh, data set. And so uh, we're running a side project now where we're uh, looking into extinct organisms. For example, the, the woolly mammoth and we've uh, played around with its uh, genomic and proteomic data, and we've uh, identified a number of antibiotics encrypted also in this, uh, in this um, fascinating uh, extinct organism. We've also uh, uh, explored uh, venoms as a source of novel antibiotics, and, and in a paper that we, we just published a couple of weeks ago uh, in PNAS, uh, we were able to computationally uh, identify a motif that is associated with increased antimicrobial and immunomolatory properties, as we can see here. And then what we did is we uh, took a, a molecule from a venom, from a wasp venom, and we engineered in that motif into the sequence. Um, and these are some of the, the findings that we obtained. We're basically able to generate a synthetic molecule that had dual activity. It was able to resolve infections <coughs> excuse me, directly by targeting the microbe and indirectly by boosting the immune system. And at the same time, it was capable of balancing the inflammatory response. This is important because whenever you have an infection, you obviously have inflammation, which is good. But oftentimes that inflammatory uh, uh, response can become exacerbated, which can lead to sepsis, uh, which, which can be lethal. And sepsis actually has been associated with a lot of the deaths that we're, uh, we're finding in, in COVID patients. But essentially, we're able to generate a synthetic molecule that, that could do both and had efficacy in, in a number of mouse models, including a sepsis model where um, uh, mice were injected with a lethal dose of, of, of bacteria, both clinically, uh, both laboratory strains and, 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 and hospital uh, uh, multi-drug resistant strains and uh, the molecule uh, and different versions of the molecule were able to uh, to essentially uh, confer protection protection to these mice. I've told you how we can use computers to both design and discover novel antibiotics. <coughs> we're currently also developing machines that autonomously create these drugs in real time. So the idea here is that we can program everything on the computer then that information can be transferred through Bluetooth to a synthesizer robot that will make the molecules the machine tells it to make. And then we can uh, connect that or streamline that to a screening robot that will screen the molecules for antibiotic activity. Then that information collected by the robot will be uh, looped back to the computer to have a self-learning uh, 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 drug discovery uh, platform that autonomously uh, creates um, uh, new, uh, new antibiotics almost in real time. 
And with that, I'd like to um, end here. I'd like to thank my lab. Uh, they really, uh, I'm surrounded by very inspiring individuals and a highly diverse and inclusive setting. And I'm really uh, thankful for that. And um, I'd like to also thank uh, our funders for allowing us to, to do the work we do. Uh, and most notably, of course, uh, the Langer Prize. And uh, this is our lab uh, website, uh, my email address, in case anybody, anybody uh, wants to reach out. And this is uh, my Twitter account, in case you are in social media. And with that, um, again, uh, thank you to AICHE, thank you to Bob, and uh, thank you all for your attention. I'll be happy to, uh, to take any questions. Thank you. Hi. I want to thank the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, ASTAT, for this prize. By enjoying this prize, in Professor Slanger's name, we are celebrating innovation and entrepreneurial excellence for the common good. We honor Professor Slanger's pioneering spirit and inspiration he gives to all of us. We celebrate ASTAT's generosity and support for the new generation of innovators, inventors, and entrepreneurs, and I'm grateful to be part of this celebration. In the call, Professor Langer shared how he personally experienced many challenges in trying to create his own path in order to do the kind of work that he really wanted to do. I'm excited to join this fellowship program, which will help me to achieve the big dreams that I have, dreams that have the potential to make the world a better place. So what made me decide to apply? Going to share my slides. It's always been my desire to help every child to develop to their full potential. However, this is one of the biggest challenges in my field, the microbiome. The idea of developing a multi-diagnostic diaper for monitoring infants' microbiome development has been at least a decade in gestation in my mind. This is a unique opportunity for me to share my vision, validate its potential impact, and refine the idea overall. I'm very much looking forward to put into action for doing a world of good. How do we proceed? Start by doing what's necessary, then what's possible, and suddenly you are doing the impossible, Francis of Assis said. I firmly believe that these are the steps for guiding us into doing good. So, what's necessary? I will go you through some snapshots of my personal experience that inspire my proposal. What's possible? I will give you background of what's possible to do with the current technology we are developing and the one I'm suggesting here to apply for this innovation. What are the impossible, impossible things we can do? I will share what I envision and invite you to imagine together a better world. So what's necessary? I've been confronted with the consequences of an unhealthy microbiome since I was a kid. This is a picture of me and my mom during a family hike. My dad is probably the one taking the picture and my brother surely exploring around. Though she is generally healthy, my mom frequently experiences gastrointestinal issues. As one in seven adults who suffer from irritable bowel syndrome, she experiences chronic relapsing symptoms, including abdominal pain and general discomfort after eating certain food, which she now learned to avoid. I grew up knowing that from time to time, she could not join a hike or a family meal because she was in pain in bed. But then, I saw some more dramatic consequences. Since a kid, I love asking questions. It says that when kids can't get all the answers, they become scientists. So we should never underestimate the depth of their questions. This picture captures one of those moments in my own childhood. I guess that's one of the reasons I love volunteering in teaching activities for kids, and I had the opportunity to do it in many countries around the world. Kids are naturally curious, imaginative, passionate about learning and exploring the world around. However, once I found kids that didn't show any signs of all that. It was during a service trip to the Andes Mountains in the Argentinian border with Bolivia. 
There, we were visiting a missionary serving a local community with poor access to health care. To my surprise, kids did not engage in any of the colorful games we brought. There were no questions, no surprise, not even misbehaviors, just apathy and weariness. What was the problem? After sharing with the volunteers from the medical team, I heard they could identify signs of many disorders, but it was impossible to have a comprehensive diagnosis in what in that uh, very remote area, so far away from the medical equipment and the experts that we needed. I felt helpless. What could I do if I didn't know what was the problem? Was it malnutrition? They had plenty of food, but were they missing some key nutrients? Were the attitudes? Was the, their water contaminated? Maybe with heavy metals from the mountains. Where are they even getting enough water? Now we know that an unhealthy microbiome impacts exploratory and communicative, communicative behaviors and cognitive performance. While teaching, I generally ask myself, are these kids growing to their full potential? How can I know? During my scientific training in Germany, Belgium, and here in the US, I've been surprised by the high percentage of kids with food allergies and many other metabolic disorders. What's going on here? Microbial strains, including beneficial microbes, may be eliminated from an individual's microbiome because of antibiotic treatments or lifestyle changes, contributing to increasing common modern disorders such as allergies and obesity. The hygiene hypothesis such as, for example, that loss of microbial diversity in the human microbiome may underlie the recent increase in the number of asthma cases. This is the big global problem, and we are seeing its consequences when it's already too late. The human body is home to at least as many microbial cells as human cells. However, the most salient characteristic of the interaction between microbes and the human body is not the number of cells involved, but they are inextricable link with each other. The majority of organisms that inhabit the human body reside in the gut. Since babies are born with an immature immune system, they depend on a highly synchronized microbial colonization process to ensure the correct microbes are present for optimal immune fu function and development. In a balanced microbiome, symbiotic and commensal species I'll compete pathogens for resources. They also provide a protective um, barrier against chemical signals and toxic metabolites. The microbiome, the microbial communities living within our bodies, can affect metabolism, development, immunity, and other aspects of human health. Imbalances in the microbiome may alter an individual's health status. Why is that? Bacteria divide metabolites have impact on the host because of several reasons. One is the high concentration. Through the lens of chemical engineering, we could say that the gut is a stop flow reactor with a selective permeable membrane. Inside this vessel, bacteria convert food into dozens of diffusible metabolites at high concentration, mid micromolar to high micromolar. Widely spread, signal at a distance. Bacteria exert their effect not only locally where they reside, but also at other sites of the human body. They release molecules that travel to other tissues, such as the liver or brain, traditionally considered sterile. It is estimated that gut microbial metabolites represent 10% of the metabolites found in mammalian blood, and their effects on hosts are only starting to be identified. Many of these molecules accumulate in horse um, in host circulation and gives them the opportunity to signal at a distance in the host. For example, short-chain fatty acids, as CFAs, produced by gut bacteria are sensed by T cells. Trimethylamine and oxide, TMO, and 4-ethylphenyl sulfate, 4-EPS, are molecules produced by gut bacteria metabolism and chemically modifying the liver which have been associated with atherogenesis and neurodevelopmental disorders, respectively. As we can see in these milestone papers that I, I noted here. The importance. 
the gut microbiota is involved in the regulation of multiple host metabolic pathways. This explains why alteration in the microbial, um, microbial communities have been related to the pathogenesis of several human diseases connected with a disturbance in metabolism, particularly those that have been increasing in incidence over the last several decades, including cancer, obesity, diabetes, atherosclerosis, inflammatory diseases, neurological disorders, among others. These associations make the microbiota an attractive avenue for engineered cell-based therapeutics that can interface with the human body. But why we can't fix it so far? The main difficulty lies in the complexity of the system. What makes the healthy microbiome? We still cannot precisely define the optimal composition of the microbiota for each individual. Even if these communities were predictable, there may be numerous ways to reconstitute them, such as they will likely be between individuals depending on human genetics, along with the presence of other bacteria. Natural systems are built bottom-up. If we think of the microbiome as a forest, where each species builds on each other in a codependent manner, how to restore it after a wildfire, for example? Even if we could know, um, sorry, the affected plant and animal communities that inhabited uh, each layer, reestablishing the original stratification from top down is impossible. But it, as, as, as it happens in a forest, catching a fire when it's just starting means less destruction and extension and in depth. The same way, if we think of the development itself, a young plant is easier to correct its direction before it's getting to a tree. While we find strategies to treat or ameliorate its consequences in older individuals, we need to be alerted of failures during the process of building the healthy microbiome in younger ones. But we are still at time to revert the adverse effects. The implications are huge. So as you can see here, um, I'm just showing um, a proposal what we are actually um, working now. Uh, proposing using engineer bacteria as the next generation for diagnosis and treatment. Here I'm showing actually some um, last uh, recent papers in which we use bacterial biosensors for diagnosis in um, locally, um, for example, in the gut, or for local and personal therapeutics. You can uh, read more in, in my reviews. The gut microbiome is more malleable in the first two years after birth, allowing diet and probiotics to make their mark. Can we exploit this to improve infants' health? Can we have an impact with lifelong benefits? So, we propose the development of a diagnostic diaper for monitoring infants' health in order to identify disease-causing agents and treat disease or advocates for lifestyle changes earlier than currently possible. Dietary intake is a principal determinant of interactions among the microbiota, chemical constituents, and fermentative substrates of the gut. Altering the diet is the main therapeutic approach for gastrointestinal disorders. Profiling intestinal and gases and metabolites and their responses to dietary change can enhance our ability to prevent, diagnose, treat, and monitor gastrointestinal disorders. We now know that metabolic screening and early detection of disorders in the gut microbiome are crucial for infants and young children. Left untreated, these disorders may affect development and have lifelong consequences. The microbiome appears to stabilize in three years old. Early events such as the mode of birth, C-sections versus natural vaginal birth, formula versus breastfeeding, perinatal antibiotics or degree of malnutrition are critical determinants of which microbiome strains children acquire. Since the average age for children to stop wearing diapers is three years old, this customiz customizable platform will allow non-invasive monitoring of dynamics and stabilization of the gut microbiome as it becomes established. We propose the development of a diagnostic diaper and an accompanying smartphone app for monitoring infant health. The multi-diagnostic diaper will track bacterial infections, metabolic disorders and deficiencies, and toxic elements in the body. 
and company app provides a platform for maintaining online communication between mother or caregiver and pediatrician to identify disease causing agents and treat disease or advocate for lifestyle changes earlier than currently possible. Our goal is to create a low cost, unobstructed product to monitor infant health at point of care. The multi diagnostic diaper is designed to alert both caregivers to conditions requiring media attention and to track health over time, detecting trends and pathological changes to multiple combinations of parameters. The app will emit a signal only when there is a reason to see a physician to follow up testing and inform doctors of developing problems before visible symptoms appear, which are required comprehensive assessment. Current methods for at-home urinalysis are based on dry chemistry, which has several limitations as a broad screening tool. We propose to use living cells to analyze urine, stool, intestinal gases in all-in-one diagnostic device incorporated into a diaper. So, what can the multi-diagnostic diaper offer? First, simplicity and convenience. Each biosensor is arranged in a multi-array following a matrix barcode. Readout is color-based. Data from the resultant pattern can be retrieved and decoded by scanning the barcode on the diaper with the accompanying mobile app to monitor trends and correlations for days or weeks. So I'm going to describe the operating system. Each position in the array deploys an engineered microbial strain designed to detect one particular biomarker, for example, nitric oxide, blood, quorum sensing signals of, for example, cholera, and trigger the expression of a reported output, for example, like C expression, um, and recombinates the base switch incorporated in the biosensors, provide these additional capabilities. So I'm going to describe this disease stage detector. Tuning the sensitivity of each biosensor will result in different activation thresholds, optimized at physiological relevant concentration of the biomarker, low, medium, or high. The digital light processing of signals of the recombinant system can discretize the magnitude of each quantity of a given biomarker into a different thresholds to determine where that biomarker is progressing to pathological levels. So here I'm showing a slide of um, my current um, research. Here we are designing genetically engineer gut bacteria, commensal bacteria, to detect biomarkers of inflammation. As you can see here, uh, in this actually published paper, we could detect um, peroxide. At different levels. So each sensor um, shows different threshold in which they are showing that is this stage um, detection going from a mild, moderate to severe disease. Reporting on disease state and severity with digitized, out digitized output is more robust than analog output. A single color reporter expressed at different levels, right? Because this la la last one that I'm saying is more susceptible to noise because, for example, by confounding families in patient studies. So that's something to take into account. So we can use this same technology also for peak detector. The inherent memory feature of recombinant-based switches will serve to um, sense and record maximum intestinal gas levels. Intestinal gases, for example, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, methane, hydrogen sulfate or various trace cases are generated by chemical interactions of gut microbiota. Immediate detection. So here I'm showing another of uh, our projects in which actually has, has been published, um, has um, been developed this technology by Mark Mimi and he has published um, his technology in this science paper um, that was used for detecting bleeding in real time. So here, um, what um, Mark is doing, they combine biosensor bacteria with a miniaturized wireless readout capsule to produce a minimally invasive device capable of in vivo biosensing in the harsh and difficult to access environment of the gut. The device successfully measures gastrointestinal bleeding in pigs, as you can see in this science paper. So the advantage of this 
um, is that um, this um, this bleeding, but now we are also extending it and, uh, uh, in, to other lava mediators of inflammation that are microbiota derived molecules and also from the from the host um, allows to measure in real time. So what's, what's the advantage of that? Stool samples should be collected as closely as possible to the onset of the diarrhea or other symptoms. Otherwise, the bacteria in them multiply and lava compounds are metabolized or degraded. With switch activation occurring within minutes of exposure, our multidiagnostic diaper would record information detected directly as soon as metabolites exit the body, avoiding stool collection, which is the current um, way of doing this. Finally, I'm going to talk also about the reliability and safety. Diagnostic accuracy and specificity are based on a test panel of multiple biomarkers, not only one, tested simultaneously, including metabolic byproducts, toxic elements, and microbiota-derived molecules. A more complex version of our system will incorporate also logic gates, linking diagnostic by a sensor with a temperature sensor, for example, that would restrict something to determine lapse of time after the stool or uni has been excreted. Finally, I'm going to talk about safety for the baby. No chemicals would be involved in this diagnostic procedure. Diagnostic microbes do not come into contact with the baby's skin as they are encapsulated and separated from the body by the diaper's absorbent core. And then environmental biocontainment to prevent the environmental escape of genetically modified organisms and satisfy bio biocontainment regulatory requirements, the diagnostic microbes will be exotrophs and able to grow and replicate without exogenous nutrients, right? This strategy will restrict the unwanted growth and replication of these organisms. To achieve redundant multi-layer and robust containment, we will use a protective hydrogel-based encapsulation system which is um, a multi-layer tough gel and anginate-based core that allows these organisms to execute diagnostic functions but prevent, prevent them from escaping. So for, for this proposal, we have chosen probiotic E. coli nisle as a chassis for its excellent safety profile for long-term use and its incapacity to colonize the gut if swallowed. However, Alternatively, we will translate the prototype of developed cell-based biosensors into a cell-free system if necessary. So, in conclusion, the ease of use, reliability, safety, and low cost make the multidiagnostic diaper uniquely suited for the sensing of pathologic and physiological signals to support the continuous monitoring of health and disease. This innovative at home biomarker based detector would easily be extended to elderly or chronic patients and will have a significant impact on both individual and public health care system. So let's get into the impossible and, and what we can imagine together. It's not the purpose of science in our world to answer every question and to solve every problem. You can read more of my perspective on this issue on an article I wrote in the context of the pandemic here. But I do believe that science has the power to reveal information of the natural way world we live in. And so we can help the community we serve to take more informed decisions for doing good. That for me is a very powerful call and, I'm, and it's very significant for me professionally. So here's a big picture of what I envision. In the same way, we now understand the factors that contribute to correct folly of proteins, which is actually my, my background during my PhD. And we can help that process to perform efficiently, tuning those conditions such as temperature, protein induction levels, or adding chaperones. Um, we can learn how to help the process also in the microbiome maduration. So if we could monitor the microbiome development and effects of dietary and lifestyle changes, we can enhance our ability to prevent, diagnose, and treat gastrointestinal disorders and many other disorders that um, would appear later in, in life. So I envision that if we can uh, use these tools to investigate, uh, to learn more on how the microbiome develops and to be able to um, do this as soon as um, the process is generated in the babies, 
we can definitely change the, the health condition of the adults of the future. With that, I want to thank you for paying attention for my um, proposal. And well, I want to thank um, my current collaborators and all the um, different sponsors, especially for ALCHG for this um, award and Pew, which is my, my current fellowship. With that, um, I hope you have a good day. Bye.